right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. Uh, we're excited to be uh, hosting this webinar today. Uh, I'm Mark Broderson, a senior researcher from the Central Regional Educational Laboratory, or REL Central at Marzano Research. Uh, we're very happy to have everyone with us today. Uh, today, we're going to provide an overview of the need for developing standards for reliable and valid teacher candidate evaluation instruments. We're also going to hear uh, from leadership from several educator preparation programs in North Dakota about their experiences in developing a teacher candidate evaluation instrument and the steps they've taken to examine its reliability and validity. We're very excited to have representatives from the Council for the Accreditation of Educator Preparation and the North Dakota Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. As I mentioned, this webinar is being hosted by REL Central. REL Central is one of 10 regional educational laboratories that is funded by the Institute of Education Sciences in the U.S. Department of Education. REL Central serves a seven-state region, including Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, and Missouri. As with all of the RELs, we are charged with providing technical assistance and conducting research on priority topics for stakeholders in our region and nationwide. All of our work is directed by our stakeholders and organized under research partnerships or alliances. This webinar is being conducted under the umbrella of our Educator Pipeline Research Alliance, which currently has projects focusing on educator preparation, evaluation, and mobility. We very much hope that this presentation is of interest to everyone that is participating today. Now I'm going to hand this over to Steve Meyer from RELF Central, who will introduce our presenters. Hey, good morning, everyone. This is Steve Meyer. I'm with RELF Central and RMC Research. I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar, and um, I'm pleased to introduce our producers, our presenters, excuse me. First, we'll hear from Gary Railsbeck of the Council for Accreditation of Educator Preparation, or CAPE, which, as uh, most of you I expect to know, is the national organization that accredits educator preparation programs. Gary is a vice president at CAPE, where he has oversight of the accreditation process and the accreditation team. He has a wide range of experience with accreditation through his work previous institutions, and at CAPE as a trained site uh, lead site visitor and inquiry brief lead site visitor. He's performed site visits in 15 states and was a reviewer with the California Commission on Teacher Credentialing and the Oregon Teacher Standards and Practices Commission. Gary's going to tell us about the CAPE guidelines for establishing the validity and reliability of assessments created by educator preparation programs and some of the challenges that programs have faced in meeting CAPE guidelines. Uh, following Gary, we're gonna hear from three presenters um, who each represent an educator preparation program in North Dakota. So Sarah Anderson is an associate professor and accreditation coordinator in the Division of Education at Mayville State University. She's a former high school spe special educator and is now teaching graduate and undergraduate pedagogical courses. Her research interests include teacher appraisal for continual improvement, core instruction progress monitoring for RTI, and effective instruction and interventions. Stacy Duffield is a professor in the School of Education at North Dakota State University. She teaches graduate and undergraduate teacher preparation courses. Her main research interests include teacher preparation, assessment, and middle level education. She's been involved with the work of the Network for Excellence in Teaching since 2010, helping to further the development of valid and reliable instruments for teacher preparation. And last, Alan Olson is a professor and assessment coordinator in the School of Education and Graduate Studies at Valley City State University in North Dakota. He teaches graduate and undergraduate preparation coursework, and he's been involved with common metric assessment efforts through the Network of Excellence in Teaching, as well as the North Dakota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education. And each of these presenters is uh, very familiar with the CAPE standards, having served as CAPE reviewers over the years. Um, and for the past few years, Sarah, Stacy, and Alan have been working as part of a collaboration of the 12 member institutions of the North Dakota Association of Colleges of Teacher Education, or NDACTI, to develop a student teacher observation tool. And so they're gonna tell us about the process they used to develop the tool and how they examined its reliability and validity. All right, next slide, I'm gonna talk about the webinar objectives. These are our objectives for today. Um, the webinar is really designed to familiarize you with the CAPE requirements for demonstrating reliability and validity of teacher candidate evaluation instruments and focusing on those developed by educator preparation programs. 
And then we'll also be talking about approaches for examining and supporting the reliability and validity of these instruments. All right, next slide. This, this is just a set of resources that um, have informed the presentations today and some things that you may um, want to refer to later. The slides um, are, uh, there's a link to the slides available, I believe, in the chat box. And this is also um, something that is downloadable via the IES website. Um, so these, just a quick uh, overview of what we're featuring here. Um, the CAPE standards themselves are the first document that specify the expectations for CAPE accreditation. Um, next is the CAPE evidence guide, which has guidance around the use of data and evidence in educator preparation and also in the accreditation process. Um, and there's also guidance in there related to data quality, data collection, and data analysis, um, and, and specific guidance related to the topic we're talking about today, which is the reliability and validity of candidate evaluation instruments. Um, next in the list is a report uh, about a teacher evaluation rubric that's used in Texas. And like the candidate evaluation tools that we're discussing today, this is a rubric-based evaluation tool and the report that we've linked here um, illustrates how evidence of reliability and validity may be generated. And then the last two bullets on this slide list a couple of resources that were developed by our presenters from North Dakota. Um, these are reports of studies that have been used to examine the reliability and validity of the student teacher observation tool, which we'll hear about in um, a little bit later. All right. So next, we'd just like to take a couple minutes to open up um, the Q&A box to uh, hear from you all this question. So we're interested, um, just to kind of kick off our thinking about this discussion in uh, you know, why you all think reliability and validity are important when evaluating teacher candidates. So um, I invite you all to use the Q&A box to weigh in with the response to this question. And we'll take a couple minutes uh, or maybe about a minute or so to allow you to do so. So again, if you um, hover at the bottom of your screen, a black bar will appear and you'll have the opportunity to click on the Q&A box and, and uh, your question. Okay, great. So we've gotten, uh, gotten a few thoughts here. Um, uh, so one, one response, let me just kind of convey what people are, have said. So why is reliability and validity important when evaluating teacher candidates? So one is for quality assurance, um, to know that we're assessing the right things. So that's the, the idea of validity really is that we're, um, you know, you're sort of measuring what you intend to measure. Um, it's important to ensure that we have a clear understanding of how we define ready to teach and ensure that we're measuring that and only that. So again, like focusing the um, content of what you're measuring to be what you intend to measure. Um, validity is, an, is a potentially important predictor of effectiveness after graduation. Um, reliability and validity help ensure that everyone is measured the same way. Um, and then knowing uh, it's information that helps know that you're doing, you're measuring candidates consistently. Uh, helps identify teachers who are most likely to be actually effective in the classroom. Um, so those are just some of the comments we're getting, I think, that are all in the spirit of um, how we collectively think about reliability and validity. So um, equity is another one, uh, making sure the instrument is measuring the concert accurately. So I think we're, um, I'm seeing that we're, we're all very much on the same page about where this comes from. And um, we're gonna, when we hear from Gary Railsback from CAPE, we're going to uh, hear a lot of these, a lot of these priorities echoed in his presentation, and I think that's where, in any measurement, you know, we're trying to make sure um, the measures are, are doing what we set set out for them to do. So, um, with that, I think I will turn this over to Gary, um, from Cape, and as I said, he's going to talk about the guidelines for establishing the reliability and validity of, of assessments created by educator prep programs and some of the challenges they faced, and we'll be hitting more on. Um, the importance of these topics in his talk as well. So let me turn that over to Gary. And Gary Rails back from Cape. So uh, thank you all for participating and especially to uh, Mark and Steve for setting this up. Um, validity and reliability are really important as EPPs 
make recommendations for states for uh, who's going to get a credential and who's going to be in a classroom. Um, so I just wanted to start off with some general reminders. Um, when EPPs start working on their self-study, we ask them to think about uh, these kind of assessments, um, performance assessments, and really two broad categories. Uh, one is a proprietary assessment, so that would be one that's been developed by somebody else. Uh, maybe it was purchased by an individual or the state, um, and the validity and reliability should have already been done on that, but we don't ask people to provide that. The, the uh, self-study just says, if available. So what we're gonna focus on today are really the larger category where you feel like those proprietary assessments don't cover all of the standards and you wanna do some things that are customized um, for your campus. They're usually developed by um, faculty. So we've got some examples here of proprietary, EdTPA, Danielson framework, um, and we're gonna spend most of our time on the latter category, EPP created assessments. So, um, I, I get lots of calls about this and people want to know what is the magic number. Um, there is no minimum. Um, there's not really a maximum, but you know, having been a site visitor, I would keep that number single digit. Um, a lot of EPPs only have two to three. So we're not looking, especially on the initial programs, uh, we're not looking for you to develop um, like the old NK policies, which said six to eight. The ones that are most common are a clinical practice observation, uh, sometimes dispositions, uh, possibly a unit plan. It could be a portfolio. Um, those are the ones that are really most common. Uh, starting fall of 19, we're also gonna be moved, moving into doing site visits for advanced level programs. And if you're not aware of that yet, I'd encourage you to look at our website to see if your programs actually fall into the scope um, but essentially what people are doing at the advanced level is they're developing some instruments that might be related to standard A11, which are the six broad professional skills, um, maybe content specific, and then if it's in a full advanced program and it has clinical practice, um, maybe something for there. Uh, they could also be doing something in um, dispositions. So as we think about validity, uh, we wanna make sure that whatever assessment we're using um, is actually measuring what it's supposed to measure, um, that it's not measuring something else and then we're using it for uh, some other purpose. So I did cite here out of our handbook, um, our definition. So it's an operation, a test, or some other kind of measure that we're really sure that's what it's a measuring. And so um, to help people think about that, CAPE developed, um, an instrument that's called the CAPE Evaluation Framework. Uh, sometimes it's called the CAPE Evaluation Tool. Sometimes it has a whole bunch of words in the title beyond that, but essentially it's, we're gonna go through that and kind of look at um, what CAPE is looking for. The way the rubric is put, the left column is below sufficiency, the middle is sufficient, and the right is uh, for the um, eager beavers that wanna get the highest grade, um, but it's not required. So that's above sufficiency. So when we look at the CAPE evaluation framework, um, there's, there's seven different sections of it, and um, section four and five are the two we're gonna look at for um, validity and reliability. Um, so for validity, uh, below the sufficient, um, we're finding places that um, there was no plan at all to establish any kind of validity. And we accept multiple kinds of validity, and this will be talked about later in the presentation as North Dakota gives their example. Um, but we need to have some validity. Is it content validity? Um, whatever. Um, we want to make sure that the instrument before it was actually used was piloted. Um, and um, we want to make sure that it was done by more than one or two people. So the common way this used to be done is two or three faculty teaching in an area might develop an instrument and then they just run with it. And so we're trying to move people to the middle, the sufficiency and involving um, some external stakeholders. Um, and then the last one is to develop some steps um, to do this research. And if it's on the below sufficiency, uh, there wasn't evidence of that in the site, um, the self-study or any other materials given. So now as we move toward the middle of the column here, the sufficient, uh, we find that there was a plan. 
We know how the EPP developed um, validity. Uh, we know what kind of validity it's looking at. Most people do content validity, um, but that's not a requirement. Um, if it was new or revised, there was some kind of a pilot, and that's um, clearly delineated in the description. Um, the EPP de details its current process or plans for analyzing and interpreting the results. Um, and then um, whatever they did follows generally accepted research um, methods. Now on the right column, some people look at that and think, well, that's what I have to get. And that's, that's just saying this is like way, and be of, uh, way um, beyond or above. Um, so you don't have to do these things. Uh, one of them is uh, reporting the validity coefficient um, using certain types of validity, which are a little more um, complex, like predictive validity. But again, those are above sufficiency and they're not required. Okay, so we'd like to take a question here. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna open up the, um, the Q&A box again. And so we'd like to hear from you. Uh, what do you think are some challenges you think EPPs face when developing teacher candidate evaluation instruments and examining the reliability and validity? Okay, so we're starting to get a few responses here. So some of the challenges that are being raised here, uh, you know, one comment is that time constraints can be a constraint. Absolutely. Um, we have another is having sufficient number of faculty to help with the process. Uh, another challenge might be to define the constructs that are to be measured. And I think uh, related to that, we have another comment here about um, measurement without the content and maybe um, how those two can be aligned. Uh, we have another one of funding and time for field testing, and I think um, you will be addressing a lot of these issues as we move forward in the presentation. Um, how about, this, we'll do this last one here, um, getting stakeholders from the public schools involved uh, might be a challenge. So thank you everyone for your comments, and uh, we're going to hear some more from, uh, from Gary. Alrighty, so um, what we're going to go through now are some examples of EPP created assessments that have been used in the accreditation uh, process, um, both initial and advanced. So um, um, again, we're looking at that evaluation framework and on the left side on uh, below sufficiency, uh, one of the things that uh, we look at is curricular validity. Uh, refers to the extent to which the content of the assessment matches the objective of a, a specific program. So, um, you know, as a site reviewer, I saw a lot of places uh, trying to give course grades and um, there's just not a lot of uh, strength in a course grade. Um, so I would encourage people not to use course grades. Um, even if it's a specific course, um, um, that's somewhat problematic. Um, end of course assessments um, might be a portfolio, it might be a term paper or whatever, but there's no discussion about validity and reliability. So those are some examples that come out on the below sufficiency. Um, some other examples, um, face validity, um, it might be a dispositional data, a lot of in a lot of EPPs develop a dispositions instrument where they ask candidates or faculty or um, the clinical faculty out in the schools to rate a candidate. Um, and it might be very qualitative or it might have no analysis. Um, another one is candidate interviews, which is a great thing to do, um, but they're often done without an instrument and there's no analysis. Uh, same thing for portfolios. Um, in the middle column, the ones that usually reach the sufficiency, um, uh, most people are doing content validities to make sure that whatever is in your rubric that you're assigning and you're using for assessment. Um, and the common ones, um, lesson plans, a lot of teacher ed programs have a unit plan, teacher work samples, um, portfolio assessments, observation, capstone thesis, um, or the better one would be a prop, uh, problem-based project that would be in partnership with a school district. Over on the right side, again, uh, this is above sufficiency, so not required, um, but it's predicting. And uh, 
That might be doing something in pre-service, trying to predict whether that, that person is gonna be um, a qualified teacher a year or two down the road. Um, and then comparisons of candidates in education programs with either other higher ed institutions, um, or it could be um, even across campus uh, if it's a content course. So for us, uh, validity is that it can be supported through evidence of the following. There's some agreement among reviewers that the description or the narrative about it is measuring the same thing. Um, there's expert validation of performance or looking at artifacts, um, expert validation of the items in an, an assessment or rating form, and then the measure's ability to predict performance in a future, and that's predictive, which is on the right side. So there's a number of different ways that um, EPPs are going about developing content validity um, for the, some of these common instruments we've talked about. Um, uh, my first couple of weeks at uh, CAPE, I got some interesting emails from people, and one email said, um, does CAPE require the LASHI method? And I said, no. And then a week or so later, I got another one, and somebody said, um, CAPE does not, re not allow you to use the LASHI method. And I don't know where these rumors started. Um, we have used the LASHI method at our CAPE conferences and a lot of other places, um, but we don't require you to use a certain kind of methodology. The LASHI method um, has been used a lot because it asks you to go out and have external um, stakeholders um, evaluating whether this is beneficial, but it's, it's really not. And the LASHI article, a little equation there, um, if algebra scares you, that's just um, the equation that's used to um, conduct the content validity uh, ratio. So, um, and I actually did this at Azusa Pacific before I left uh, last year, um, take some P12 based educators, um, if it's content, um, maybe faculty members, P12 administrators, leaders, um, candidates, partners, parent advisory boards, in other words, you're getting people that are familiar with what you're doing and you're asking them. And then um, you can do this in a survey, you can send it out electronically, and you're just asking people, is this task that we're asking somebody to do, is it essential for whatever the, the task is of the job, classroom teaching, school counselor, school administrator, whatever, is it essential, is it useful but not essential or not necessary? And then um, you just determine how many people that you um, ask. And if you have a, a lot of pan a panelists, anything beyond 50% is most likely gonna get you um, a content validity ratio. So you don't have to go out and hire a psychometrician or have somebody from your psych, psych department do this. Um, it's just going out and working with your, um, your advisors, your advisory counselor, whatever that might be. So the, our definition of reliability is the degree to which test scores for a group of test takers are consistent over repeated applications of a measurement and are inferred to be a dependable and repeatable for an individual test taker. Now, if EPPs are developing two to three assessments, one person may not take it more than once. Um, so we're not saying that you have to do it. But as you look at it over the three cycles, uh, you might be able to tell a little bit about that. The next slide talks about reliability. And so again, we're going back to the CAPE evaluation framework. On the left side, um, what makes it below sufficiency is the plan to establish reliability does not reform reviewers whether reliability is being investigated or how. Um, so the reviewers don't really know what was going on. The described steps do not meet accepted research standards for reliability or that there's actually just no evidence. Um, what most people are doing is uh, when we go to the middle column is they're doing inner rate of reliability. Um, so let's say it's an observation instrument. They're having a, a candidate um, observed by a classroom teacher and a faculty member and they're looking at those two scores to determine what the inner rate of reliability is. Uh, it can be sub supported by multiple raters of the same event, um, and it doesn't have to be live. One of them could have been on video. Um, we're looking for stability or consistency of ratings over time and evidence of internal consistency of those measures. So um, here's a little example. Um, 
that um, we put together to kind of think about this, uh, supporting the reliability. Uh, first of all, you start with content expert, um, some kind of feedback on that um, instrument. Then you get some feedback, you clarify it, you may change it a little bit. Um, you get content experts, uh, developers of the measure to review and seek feedback. Then you pilot and you examine that data. So um, common challenges EPPs um, uh, staff face in meeting the CAPE standards. So uh, if you look at the CAPE standards, the component we're looking at is 5.2, um, where it asks that your um, instruments are uh, valid and reliable. So most of the time, as I've said, there's gonna be two or three, and they might be for standard one about content or pedagogy, they might be in standard two about something about clinical practice. They might be in standard three about dispositions or uh, something that's non-academic. And so what our teams do is they look at all those instruments, two or three of them, and then they say, do the majority of them, um, the new handbook starting fall of 18 moved to 75%, do 75% of them meet the sufficiency criteria? So if you go back to my slides, that middle section, that's really what we're looking for. And what we find in most cases is they haven't done content validity, um, or it was done by two or three people, or we don't really know how they did it. And um, as far as the inner rate of reliability, which is the most common method, um, we don't find much evidence of that. And that's, what, um, that's a change from both NCATE and TIAC to actually say you're making a consequential decision. Um, how can you, um, how can you demonstrate that? The other thing I'd say about standard five of the five standards, it's the one that most institutions had trouble meeting. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over um, to the North, North Dakota group. Great, thanks so much, Gary. Um, so I think we'd like to take a few minutes here to um, see if folks have questions uh, related to Gary's presentation um, before, we, before we move on to North Dakota. So again, um, I'll invite you all to use the Q&A box um, to submit some questions. Um, so one question, Gary, was around um, the last thing that you said about standard five. Apparently there was an audio problem for, for at least one person. Okay. So standard five is the quality assurance um, standard that asks essentially for an EPP to have um, partners, stakeholders, uh, you define what that is, and having them involved with creating your instruments, evaluating, looking at data, and then using that for program re um, improvement in the future. So that kind of cycle that um, the regional accreditors are also pushing EPPs um, to work toward, that's the one that um, more institutions have gotten either stipulations with or on probation um, because they don't have, um, they don't fully meet that standard. And the big part of that is 5.2, component 5.2, which looks at um, validity and reliability of the instruments that you're using in your quality assurance system. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, another question is around um, whether there uh, is an expectation that assessments used for operational assessment will need to have reliability or validity. Um, so operations like on the unit? That's a good question. Maybe yeah. I'll ask the I'll ask the uh, questioner to clarify that question. Yeah. I need some more clarification on that. Okay. So an another question. Um, in the meantime, how is keep building consistency among chairs and teams to look for and rate validity and reliability? Well, that's a very good question. Um, so I've been working with training volunteers the last uh, two summers, and we're now doing it uh, regionally. So I did one in West Virginia and one in Tennessee this fall. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to Mississippi. And so that's what we're working with, um, with new trainees. Um, the CAPE evaluation framework has been out there, I think, since about 2015. So it's not really new. Um, but um, getting those 500 uh, volunteers that were trained several years ago back in, uh, we haven't 
we haven't had a chance to do that yet. Um, and that's why uh, we do a lot of webinars. We try to get people to go to CapeCon. Um, but even if it doesn't happen at the team level, it goes to the Accreditation Council. And I've also been doing the training for them to make sure that they are um, that there is inter-rater reliability between the individuals and the different panels. Um, and that's really where the major decision is made. Again, we're looking for meeting all, uh, if you look at that evaluation framework, there are five sections on a performance assessment, and then section six and seven are about surveys. So if you just look at the first five, we're looking for um, a summary statement that the EPP created assessments are at that essential category. It's not, well, you got one wrong or you got two wrong. It's uh, um, a summary statement. Great. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Um, another question is around what is the expected inter rater reliability coefficient? Can you say a little more about that? Yeah. So that actually hasn't been in the evaluation framework, but it is in the handbook, and the suggestion is 0.8. Um, but it's one of five factors. Um, so it's not like if you don't have 0.8, then the, it's going to sink the whole ship. That's one of five factors. Great. Okay. And I think just one last question. Um, so this is a, um, you know, an individual who says their program has three distinct pathways that use three different clinical field evaluations. Um, would they be expected to come together and create one evaluation tool if they plan to use the clinical experience for uh, you know, tool for validity and reliability? That's a good question. Um, so if you're talking about an initial program that has three pathways, and I'm certainly familiar with that, um, you, that's a choice you need to make if you want to have three different instruments. Uh, what CAPE says is any um, performance assessment you're using to make the case your program meets the CAPE standards needs to be uh, valid and reliable. So if you, you can either do each one of those three and make sure they're all valid and reliable, or you could take the best of them, put them together in one, and, and make sure that it was. But that would be a campus choice. You decide if those programs are really different, um, you know, then that's a decision that you get to make. Great. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. And thanks, everyone, um, for submitting questions. Um, we are soon, we're going to shift over to our presenters from North Dakota. Um, Dr. Uh, Stacy Anderson, or sorry, sorry, Sarah Anderson, Stacy Duffield, and Alan Olson. Um, they will be talking about uh, a candidate evaluation tool that they collabor collaboratively developed called the Student Teacher Observation Tool. Um, and before we get into their conversation, we're going to take one more moment to have um, a quick Q&A to just kind of kick off this conversation with a discussion of what you think are the pros and cons of educator preparation program staff developing their own instruments versus purchasing or adapting an existing instrument. So as I'm sure um, many of them like PA that are fairly administered. Um, some states have um, tools that are administered statewide. Um, but just wanted to kind of, before we get into this conversation, North Dakota's work, to think about um, collectively about what some of the pros and cons are of doing local development of an instrument versus adapting something that's already out there. So please uh, consult your Q&A box once more and, um, and share your thoughts. Okay, so one comment is that um, uh, you know a locally developed educator prep program developed instrument can be tailored to address a local mission. So there may be local priorities or um, you know uh, emphases that you can better reflect on a locally developed tool. Um, it's more customized. One one advantage is there are more opportunities to uh, test the reliability and validity in a local context. So you know that's um. Certainly an important aspect is that uh, you can kind of demonstrate reliability and validity for the candidates who you're serving. And if you have a locally developed tool, the opportunity to do that may be better. Um, there is also the potential of less costs with a locally developed tool. Um, a downside here, we have a comment is that, um, you know, you have to actually go through the process yourself of, of evaluating the tools, reliability and validity. You can't, 
you know, you can't uh, draw upon some existing study that may be out there for a widely available tool. Um, of course, you can tailor the tool to exactly what you want to measure. Um, okay, a couple other comments. Um, you know, one advantage, which we're going to hear about from our North Dakota colleagues, is that look, you know, locally developed instrument may give you the opportunity to partner with other um, institutions in your locale to uh, put together something that kind of makes sense for um, the uh, candidates who you serve in a, in a particular area. So, you know, if you're looking to meet um, standards for, for a given locale, like a state or a district, and you're trying to meet certain priorities, um, you have the opportunity to partner with other folks, and there are other advantages of partnership that we'll hear about. Uh, so maybe I'll just mention one more. Um, one of the cons of adopting a widely administered instrument, like a commercial instrument, is it may not align particularly well with um, your state standards or your program values. So thanks a lot for sharing all those things. There are lots of uh, factors to weigh in making this decision about developing something locally versus, um, you know, adopting something that's already out there. Um, so I'm excited to uh, turn over control to our North Dakota colleagues. Um, we are, uh, Ellen Olson is going to start out this conversation and um, they're going to talk about their work in developing the student teacher observation tool and um, also the work they've done to demonstrate its reliability and validity. So over to you, Alan. As representatives from the North Dakota Association of Colleges for Teacher Education, we like to share our experiences about creating a valid and reliable assessment instrument. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Olson from Valley City State University. I'll tell you about some of the benefits and challenges, pros and cons that we experienced while we developed an EPP created assessment and a little bit about our collaborative process. Uh, Dr. Sarah Anderson from Mabel State University will discuss the process that we used for developing the instrument and then Dr. Stacy Duffield from North Dakota State University will explain the NDACT efforts to establish reliability and validity of the assessment instrument. Our experience began when North Dakota EPPs were transitioning from NK to CAPE, and we had a common need. We had assessments, but they didn't all have actionable descriptors, and they weren't quite at the depth we needed to have. And so the need was to develop valid, reliable, practical assessments in order to gather uh, data that we could analyze for program improvement and meet our accreditation standards. We wanted quality assessments so we could get quality data, and we all needed to make those types of improvements. So the idea for collaboration uh, came about because it was mutually beneficial for all of us. We all had a similar need, and we could share expertise among our colleagues across the campuses to fulfill that need. Uh, we're going to talk about sharing among the institutions, but even within our own institution, then we have to share on our own campuses and find colleagues with different talents and ex different expertise to help us if it's only our EPP. But in this case, we'll be talking a little bit more about collaborating across institutions. The concept of having common assessments uh, is something that we came about because we wanted to meet the CAPE sufficient levels and we were used to the work that was being done by the Network for Excellence in Teaching Efforts. It was funded by the Bush Foundation in Minnesota and our state of North Dakota received permission from the NEXT, this Network, of, Network for Excellence in Teaching for their exit survey, completer survey, and employer surveys. And we liked this idea of some common assessments the institutions didn't have to use in our state, but could use in our state in order to have valid and reliable instruments. And we believed that we could uh, develop a student teaching instrument that would meet the CAPE sufficient levels and become a quality assessment that each of us can use. We pursued a grant from the AACTE, and that was the beginning of our collaborative process. Some of the benefits and challenges that we found in collaborating with each other, uh, some of the benefits, getting a variety of perspectives uh, really was helpful to us, and often we had ideas from multiple stakeholders that uh, ended up uh, making a difference for us and uh, the idea that one of us can have an idea but 
with the help of others, sometimes that idea can be much greater than anything we'd have thought of individually or on our own. We involved our stakeholders to increase the potential of skill and expertise for research or assessment or field experience that could help us. And also it gave us a common language. When we were talking to each other across universities, we had the same assessment. And so we had the same types of data so we could talk apples and apples with each other compared to the days when we all had our own separate student teaching instruments and even the same topic of assessment, the questions might be different, or planning lessons, the questions might be different. And now we had a common language, common assessments, and we could share with each other. It improved our communication and networking for future collaboration. And it also, uh, we talked about having mutually beneficial needs uh, and how this was going to help us, and it did help all of us fill the need for uh, what we needed to do for assessment. It also helped us uh, have some common assessments so that if somebody was going to have a, a cooperating teacher was going to have a student teacher from Valley City one year and Mayville the next year and NDSU the next year and the University of North Dakota the next year, they'd still have the same instrument and principals could be used to same or similar completer surveys, um, employer surveys, and our cooperating teachers could be used to similar student teaching instruments. And that was helpful for our cooperating teachers in our state as well. And then the collaboration of using with uh, working with other partners helped share resources and expertise as well. Some of the challenges would be that it does take more time and effort to get together, figure out schedules, and get to meet is a challenge. And there has to be some, some concessions. So some loss of autonomy uh, is a challenge for collaboration. Some of our pros and cons of having an EPP created assessment and the ones that were discussed that Steve was able to gather in the chat, they were excellent about uh, tailoring the uh, instrument to be more exact or uh, having a local instrument to meet a local mission or being able to be more customized. Those were all great points that people mentioned. For us, we talked about how we work with standards to begin with, but then we could proceed with a little bit more freedom uh, like the in-task wording, that is pretty lengthy, and all the in-task uh, items gets to be pretty lengthy. We had a little more freedom and autonomy to make our own decisions about uh, well, how we would use those, and then a greater opportunity to develop assessments that were practical and meaningful to our EEPs and our state, and items could be lined or complement other assessment instruments. We had an exit survey, a completer survey, an employer survey that we liked, we wanted to have some alignment, not only in task, but with our other surveys, so we could look across instruments and across perspectives of cooperating teachers, student teachers, first-year teachers, and employers of our first-year teachers. And then also an assessment that could be validated to the population using the instrument. And I think the other uh, comments that came in from people on the chat were excellent. Some of the cons, increased time and effort, more responsibility for the process, and some of us would lack confidence in our, our validity, reliability, statistical analysis type things, and that's where we need to seek some expertise, or as Gary mentioned, something like the law sheet method isn't quite as complicated to find ways that we can find uh, validity and reliability um, that maybe aren't quite as complicated, or to seek some expertise from some partners to help us and then the creation process can cost money and, and take time. Uh, we've been able to share about our student teaching assessment instrument at some different uh, AACT and CAPE conferences before and at the state level, and we've had some people from other states have interest in our assessment tool, and this is a, an idea of some of the other states that uh, people from different institutions have shared uh, some interest in the observation tool that we created to be valid and reliable for use in our state. All right, thank you, Al. Um, so really, our, this is Sarah Anderson from Mayville State University um, chiming in, and I'm going to share a little bit more about our process and outline what that looked like. So our decision to collaborate on this common performance evaluation was really prompted, as Al mentioned, by that chapter support grant from the American College Association of Colleges for Teacher Education. We were awarded that chapter grant 
um, way back in June of 2015. And subsequently at our state chapter monthly meeting that September, representatives from our NDACTE organization then made the collaborative decision to select what would become our fourth statewide common metric. So our discussion then led to the selection of our pre-service teacher performance measure that would again accompany our exit survey transition to teaching, which is administered one year post-graduation as well as our employer surveys. So this decision then um, really became a part of the, the discussion that was occurring across a number of our educator preparation programs with their school partners. Um, as about five of our local EPPs were in conversation with three of our larger school districts in our state about how could we simplify processes, how could we make field experience and student teaching placements more of a common process, how could we identify what some of those best practices were and really make it easier for our cooperating teachers that are working with teacher candidates coming in from a variety of institutions. That really made this work very timely when we were thinking about our partner schools and what their needs were as well. So I volunteered to lead that work along with six of my committed colleagues from NDACTE. We ensured that we had representation on that subcommittee across the different types of institutions in our state that included research institutions, regional, private, as well as our tribal uh, teacher preparation programs. So with that, um, we were able to take a look at that purpose statement of why were we doing this in the first place. And Al explained that very well, that we did have this need. It was evident. We had a very clear, um, uh, clear statement from that case sufficiency um, rubric that told us that we need to, to look at our validity and reliability in a very different way. And so that purpose was pretty clear at the beginning of what our end goal needed to look like. So the steps then to start gathering the information from the tools really first began um, with taking a look at what was already in place. We, as the 12 universities, did have um, all of our own performance assessments, which did serve the purpose of evaluating pre-service teaching skills. Each of our tools did have alignment to begin with within TASC and our CAPE standards, but as I mentioned, um, none of really which completely met those sufficiency requirements for validity and re reliability. So we really did start um, with some good, good basis for developing a common tool. Those tools, as we uh, collected them from all of our partner institutions, had a variety of rating levels, whether that was from a one to four or one to three. We had both quantitative and qualitative formats that were in place. Uh, again, varying levels of actionability of the descriptors in those statements and a number of elements for rating, um, ranging from very small numbers to very um, intensive numbers. Um, so as our institutions then were working through how are we going to move forward, not only did we take our own instruments and take a look at those, but we also took a look at our P12 partners to see what was happening in our schools. We really wanted to make sure that a pre-service um, evaluation instrument was also aligned with what was happening with teacher supervision and evaluation in our state. And so across our institutions, we found that the most common ways teacher evaluation was being conducted was through the Marzano teaching uh, teacher evaluation model, the Danielson framework for teaching, and the Marshall teacher evaluation rubrics. So these were brought to our subcommittee also as part of our starting point for instrument development. So the committee also then took a look at other literature, doing essentially a literature review to see if there were other developed models beyond these ones that we could use also to inform our process. So as we gathered each of these tools, we pulled them together and then came back to our basis of our in-test standards, which when we took a look at the standards progressions actually had 166 individual constructs. Um, to measure the skills of teaching, which if we're going to put that into the hands of a cooperating teacher um, is not uh, exactly well received in terms of their time, energy, and effort. And so we knew that we, we needed to make this feasible, um, also looking at who would be filling this out. We also then specifically looked at the CAPE standards and um, take, took a look at what the, the STOT would be used for as evidence within our programs. So through that process, we acknowledge that we really would be addressing our candidate knowledge, skills, and dispositions of standard 1.1. We would be collecting evidence for state and SPA reports in standard 1.3. We would also be addressing our partnerships with our P12 schools 
uh, as explained in CAPE Standard 2. We also really needed to investigate how the tool would provide evidence for Standard 3 of selectivity during preparation and at completion. And so we knew that we would be developing this tool with those end goals in mind. We also wanted to ensure that within the final product that we were able to address the cross-cutting themes of diversity and technology. And so those in the instrument was developed to make sure that we could address each of those items. So coming back to some of the steps, um, our subcommittee then, as we pulled together all of these resources, which was really in that development phase, um, we had to, of course, uh, collaborate in person. That was one of our greatest um, assets, was the ability to come together um, because of funds by that uh, chapter grant from AACTE to do the work face-to-face. -face. Um, and that did, did have a, a huge taxation on resources and time for us, uh, as we, we full know what a faculty's workload um, can be in a typical week or month. So we had about four work sessions where we were face-to-face, -face, three to four hours and one full day. We had a number of web-based meetings and some smaller work in pairs on each of those 10 impact standards and the associated items on the spot. We had a number of times where drafts were sent out to committee members for review at each institution and again to touch base on expertise in certain areas. That uh, brought us to a period of refinement. So as we moved through with the refinement, the seventh draft was actually the first draft that we brought to the whole NDACTE statewide group for review and institutional feedback. We also at that point gathered um, some information from Cape site visit reviewers. We also brought our, our draft, our seventh draft, to the Cape staff for some additional guidance and ensuring that we were on the, the right track. And we ended up with 12 drafts before we were ready for an initial pilot, um, which I think speaks to the complexity of the task that we were given um, and also to the, um, the quality of the end result. So we really did consider um, at this point the use of the half point scale, whether or not those would be included. Those were based on Marzano's proficiency scales and we did take a look um, during some pilot explo exploratory factors of if our cooperating teachers were choosing to use the half points and they really did. A, a large number of them chose to, to use those half points based on that Marzano um, proficiency scale. So we ended up with a seven point scale. We had multiple discussions about the performance levels and the labels and what those words would be. Again, referring back to our 12 institutions, and as Al mentioned, we, we had to make some concessions. Um, at our institutions, we might be using levels and labels differently than the statewide tool would look at, and it was one of the pieces that we did have to compromise um, sometimes at our institutions on, that we were, were changing those indicators. We also at this point considered the use of does not language within the actionable descriptors and we ensured that the order was from the distinguished category or level four um, that was listed first next to the actual in, uh, item. You can also see in this example from INTAS standard one with our, our two elements that are being evaluated that we also made sure that we had very clear connection back to which INTAS standard was being measured. That then led us to the next portion of our work, which was in our first pilot. And so that first pilot was a voluntary participation of an exploratory factor analysis in May of 2016. We again leveraged our funding from the AACTE grant and North Dakota State University and DSU conducted that analysis. Um, and my colleague Stacy will describe a little bit later on here the pilot and validation process and what those results looked like. From that first exploratory factor analysis, we looked towards some instrument refinement and what would end up being uh, our, our final version. And we took uh, those results and recommendations. We took those, especially the double-barreled items. We had a lot of items that um, had multiple indicators being measured. We worked through those together. We looked at the language and how they were loading on alternate factors to direct them more towards what they were intended to measure. That refinement process really worked specifically with the verbiage of those actionable descriptors and again a collective and collaborative process to reach that end goal. We also at this point with the first pilot had some stakeholder feedback through our institutional advisory boards, through graduate students in educational leadership programs, and we also held a presentation at our Department of Public Instruction State Conference where we could solicit feedback from across the state from administrators and teachers in the field. 
Uh, we brought that uh, back to our NDACT committee and that resulted in six more drafts as recommendations continued to come in. And pilot two then, the second exploratory factor analysis occurred in December of 2016. This was completed with our 18th version of the, the STOT. We administered that through cooperating teachers working with student teachers from 11 of our 12 institutions and results showed some pretty impressive communalities which we'll share with you in a few moments here. So from that second pilot, we ended up coming to a final version which we, we know as draft 20 and this is what you will find available on the NDACTE website um, and that is available for download uh, at this time. And simultaneously to implementing the, the 20th draft, which was the first to go statewide, we were also the recipient of a second AACTE chapter support grant, which would help fund the development of inter reliability training modules that again could be used statewide. So the first time that the STAT went statewide in North Dakota was the 2017-2018 academic year. We really wanted to ensure that there was institutional flexibility in the administration. Um, what systems it would be put into uh, to collect that data for each institution could be used with whatever system was in place. And again, how that institution chose to use data for decisions within their own programs was maintained. So for example, at Maisel State University, um, we operate with the TAP Stream operational system and all of the STOT items can be put into that system uh, for us to use. We use it formatively during the clinical experience with acceptable targets for performance that are set by our own faculty. And we use that for making continuance decisions within our program for our candidates. We also use it summatively during the student teaching experience and we have that completed by the student for self-evaluation reflection as well as by the cooperating teacher and the university supervisor so that we do have those multiple perspectives. So each institution is left with that flexibility of how they will use uh, the STOT within their, uh, their frames of reference. So the inner rate of reliability training module is now in, uh, available. So again, at the ndacte.org website you, that was released in October of 2018, uh, you also have that STOT and validity information um, that was mentioned at the beginning and you have links to at the start of this presentation. That inter-rater reliability training involves panels of experts from across three of our North Dakota institutions. Um, again, some teaching videos that uh, were used to practice evaluating and using the STOT and some training as well as on bias and what that looks like when uh, ratings are being given. We also utilize some examples from student cap capstone portfolios as some of the items that were used for training. So at this stage, we are actually working on the confirmatory factor analysis. We had enough changes between the first and the second pilot that the confirmation occurred during our first full use of statewide, uh, statewide data. So the process for doing that is that here at North Dakota State University, um, the analysis is run. We take that information and results from our own institutional system and we place that into a common data template and that data is then all processed together. So we have both um, an aggregate score from the state of North Dakota and we also then have our institutional numbers, which for smaller regional institutions, this is one of the um, greatest advantages is that we can have a bigger end to work with in terms of doing some of the statistical work as well. So NDSU has really served as the lead research university conducting that work and we are at the point now as we will be seeing those results very shortly to do a second round of revision and refinement of that tool as we ourselves engage in the continuous improvement process. And the exciting part of all this work um, and the collaboration that's occurred amongst our institution is um, that this confirmatory analysis work of the STAT is actually occurring alongside our fifth statewide assessment, which is the disposition evaluation and uh, an exploratory factor analysis has been completed with that and we are piloting that across the state this semester. All right, thank you so much for all that great information. Um, uh, before we move forward and uh, talk about the approaches that have been taken to look at the reliability and validity of the stop, um, we want to open up a poll and uh, get your thoughts about uh, can an instrument be unreliable but valid. So if you have a chance, uh, you should have the, see the poll results up in front of you. And so just take a moment and then uh, 
we will move forward. Okay, so they're starting to slow down. Um, what we have so far is 51% uh, say, other respondents say yes, the instrument could be unreliable but valid. 38% say no, it cannot be unreliable and valid. And 11% say that it depends. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So the answer is no. For a test to be valid, it must be reliable. So as we discussed, you know, there's different definitions or, or approaches for validity, but basically, you know, validity is, are you measuring what you think you're measuring, or are the conclusions based upon those data, the assumptions you're making about those, can those be supported? Uh, if a test is unreliable and that it generates different results when you use it, the uh, items inside of it are not consistent with each other, you do not know uh, exactly what it is that you're measuring. It might be a measure of a uh, teacher content knowledge in an area, but if, if the test is unreliable, it's also picking up something else. So generally speaking, a test must be reliable as a requirement for validity. Uh, so thank you everyone for your responses, and I think we're gonna learn a little bit more about reliability and validity as it was uh, addressed with the stop. Um, so I'm Stacy Duffield, I'm from North Dakota State University, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, the process that we underwent to ensure validity and reliability of the student teacher observation tool. And I want to repeat what Sarah said, just kind of getting us started, that we did have some grant support um, that enabled us to do a lot of this work that, um, that may not have been possible had we not had some of that funding support from AACT for our chapter grant. Um, and we also had, our, through our experiences with the Network for Excellence in Teaching, um, had a protocol and a great deal of experience in doing this work through the um, development valid and validation of the um, network's common metrics. And so we did have a bit of an advantage in that work. So I'm gonna walk through um, the five types, the five things that we did for our validity and reliability process. Um, and so I think it's, when we look at this process, it's really important to start at the beginning of the staff development process. And Sarah just went through a great deal of that, but I'm going to parallel that with the work we did with the validity and reliability work. Um, we really um, followed, I guess, the Wiggins and McTie understanding by design process, where we began with the end in mind, and we knew that we wanted to end with a valid and reliable instrument. And so with that, we recognized that we needed to be very mindful of what needed to happen along the way to ensure that we had a high quality instrument um, through that development process. It wasn't something we could think about at the end. So we worked toward that quality with um, three types of validity that included content, base, and construct validity. So as Gary pointed out, we did exceed what CAPE would require for sufficiency. Um, we also wanted to ensure both internal and inter-rater reliability, and I'm just going to walk through um, kind of over the, uh, an overview, I guess, of how we did that work to ensure validity and reliability for the stat. So first, space validity. Um, space validity doesn't mean that an instrument really measures what it's supposed to measure, but rather that um, in the judgment of the raters, it appears to do so. So it's a fairly low bar, um, but at the same time, that's the place you need to start. Um, so while it's the least sophisticated, it's still important because it engages users and asks them if the instrument seems to meet its intended purpose. Um, we established face validity through that pilot and feedback process that Sarah described with the cooperating teachers and university supervisors. We also, as part of that, had added an open-ended feedback item to the pilot um, at the end, and we invited the um, the university supervisors and the um, university, or the university supervisors and cooperating teachers to give us um, qualitative feedback as they were filling it out. Um, so just kind of in summary, while face validity is useful and it's important as a part, a beginning part of the process, um, when you're developing an instrument, it's just not enough. And so we went forward from there. So with content validity um, was our next type of validity we looked at. And while it's similar to face validity, it really does take a more formal approach and often uses some lower level statistics like Gary talked about with the LASHI method. Um, it does involve ex experts in the field and those experts judge the questions and how well they cover the material or the content that you want to assess. We wanted to make sure that the stat act items actually measured 
what it was we wanted them to measure. And so when composing the items, as Sarah described, we began with the in-task standards and those other measures that were being used in the field. And we aligned the stat with previously validated instruments, the next surveys that were mentioned. Um, content validity is often measured by relying on the knowledge of people who are familiar with a construct. And these subject matter experts are provided with access to the tool and they're asked to provide feedback and we did those processes. But then the next step is really important and that was a formal systematic analysis of that feedback that we received and it informed our decisions as Sarah talked about with the different versions that as the team went through as we developed what we would share with our stakeholders. So with construct validity, um, again, this, this does exceed what CAVE would require um, necessarily, but we, we knew we had the funding, we knew we had invested people in the process, and we knew that we did have the resources and expertise, and so we did want to make sure that we did get that internal validity. So construct validity is the extent to which the instrument captures a specific theoretical construct or trait, and we did this through a factor analysis. The initial exploratory factor analysis was then used for revision, um, but because the revisions that we did were fairly substantial, um, we weren't able to move forward with just a CFA or a confirmatory factor analysis. We really did need to run a completely separate exploratory factor analysis. And so in the end, we've had the instrument has undergone two exploratory factor analyses. And I'm um, trying to achieve, um, or trying to get our hypothetical constructs um, to, to wash out in the, in the factors. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the work that we did. Um, we began with uh, four hypothesized factors, as Sarah said, we used the INTAS standards, and so we went, um, our hypothesized factors were the categories that INTAS uses, so the learner and learning, content knowledge, instructional practice, and professional responsibility. And we wrote our items with those constructs in mind, um, wanting, in the end, that for them to bear out in the factor analysis. Um, so the internal fact, the first internal factor analysis, the first EFA that we did, um, we only um, ended up with two factors. So the first three constructs, learner and learning, content knowledge and instructional practice, all kind of hung together in one large um, unwieldy construct. And um, we had a second factor that did represent the professional responsibility. And so as Sarah said, there was a pretty lengthy um, revision process and we went back to work on the items and um, found that we had some double barreling, we had some unclear wording, we found that we were using um, words that were probably making people think about instructional strategies instead of um, perhaps content knowledge. And so we um, just really went back to work and thought about how the wording was impacting the way people were interpreting the items. And we do have those validity and reliability analyses um, for view out on the NDACTE website. So if you are one of those statistical people that would really like to read about the oblique growth rotation and, or oblique solution and the um, KMO and all of those things, um, you are very welcome to go out and take a look at that, but I won't go that deep um, for this. But you can take a look at the chart that we have on the screen and you can see that we actually um, ended up with some really nice numbers. Um, with 0.35 kind of being the threshold, you can see that we're well above that. All right, so the next slide. Um, so the second, oh, the second um, pilot um, exploratory factor analysis, um, we had taken the assessment instrument down to 34 items, which we felt was, was um, pretty manageable for a cooperating teacher. We also did some work with timing, like how long would it take a cooperating teacher to complete this, and really thought carefully about wanting to make sure that we got, um, everybody was completing the instrument, and that we were getting good data, and they weren't just rushing through. Um, and so we were pretty mindful about all those sorts of things as we were um, creating the instrument. Um, what you're seeing on the screen right now are example results from the second pilot. And um, in addition to um, the more sophisticated sophisticated statistical analysis doing the exploratory factor analysis. We also just did some basics with um, frequencies um, with the responses and looking at means and standard deviations because it helped us to see things like was our scale working. 
um, were people able to um, use those half point items? What did they think of those? And in some of our feedback and um, some of the more qualitative data that we gathered along the way, we heard from those cooperating teachers and university supervisors that those half points were critically important. And what we found is that we were getting more accurate ratings because um, when, when someone was between scores, um, say was a little bit better than a proficient level, but they weren't quite distinguished, people were um, choosing the top rating because they wanted um, to acknowledge that. And so we were ending up with inflated ratings. And when we were able to give that half point, that above a proficient could be recognized without going to the next category and creating those inflated ratings. And so you can kind of see here how they broke down. And you can see, especially with the 3.5 and the 2.5, um, those half ratings were heavily used. And so then um, looking at reliability, um, what, uh, what was just pointed out in the question before this section, you have to have reliability if you're going to have validity. And so we did run an internal reliability um, using a Chromevax Alpha, which is probably something that is pretty familiar to most of us. And we did get uh, very good numbers. You can see that they're all um, 0.9 and above. Um, and in some cases, what you'll hear is that um, above 0.9 is too high, but that's um, relative and it's in context. And so we went back to look and it told us that we were getting, um, that we may have some repetitiveness in the, in the instrument. But going back and looking, we really found that um, we had trimmed it down to 34 items and that every item we had in there really was necessary. And so we didn't feel that um, looking at the items themselves that we were worried about being above 0.9. Um, we were happy with the results and felt we needed to keep the items that were there. And then finally, Sarah talked a little bit about inner rater reliability. And we know that you can have a great instrument. It could have um, incredible um, internal validity and reliability, but if it isn't being used properly and you don't have inner rater reliability, it, your data isn't worth much. So your interpretations aren't going to be high quality. And so it was very important to us to take that next step and work on inner rater reliability. And we had the second chapter grant and we're able to um, work with the expert panels. So we found videos um, that were teachers teaching, um, kind of everyday teachers in classrooms, and we would just use short excerpts um, to focus the viewing on particular indicators, making the accuracy, accuracy of the rating more likely. Um, we used expert panels, and we set a minimum of at least five members in each panel. And um, the person that was on the expert panel needed to be an expert at the level of the classroom featured in the video, and for secondary needed um, to have some expertise in that content area as well. We used a rating process, and in fact, this whole process, we really need to give a lot of credit to Erica Brownstein from Ohio State and the work that she did. Um, we really borrowed heavily from the process she used. We spoke to her. We went to her sessions at different conferences and um, really found that useful. And the rating process that we used, um, first we had the expert panel rate independently. So they watched the video and they rated without any influence from anyone else and then determined what evidence they were using for that rating. And so we had them jot down notes on a record document their thinking around why they gave that rating. Then um, the group um, spoke together about the ratings and presented their rationale to each other. And after that conversation, then the raters re-rated the video and arrived at a consensus rating based on the evidence. And so that became the foundation for the training modules that you'll see out on our um, NDACT website. And um, you'll see that you have the expert rating panel and we have the videos in there and then um, along with what Sarah described at the beginning, just some basic training on um, removing bias from their ratings. And so finally, I just wanted to share this slide. This is just a sample of the independent rating and how it was collected. Um, in this particular case with this expert panel, we used Qualtrics, a survey platform, and um, loaded the video up on a link. And the independent raters sat by themselves um, before coming to the meeting, and they did their independent rating and entered their feedback. And so um, when they gave different levels of feedback, they entered their evidence in and, um, so that we could see that beforehand. And it was all recorded and documented so that we had that um, 
kind of systematic and formal approach to doing this integrator reliability training. And then we met together to do um, to do the uh, consensus work, and uh, we had a facilitator for each of those groups that did the documentation and collected that evidence. So we have all of that, um, very much like a research project, to be honest. Um, and that kind of ends the end of what I want to talk about, but if you have any more questions, because it was just a survey, um, you can absolutely reach out to us or ask questions right now, and we'll try to, to do more clarification or add more detail. And we just thank you for this opportunity to share our experience and um, perhaps give you some ideas for some of the work you might want to do on your own campuses and with collaborators across your state. All right. Well, thank you so much. It's all very interesting. So. Uh, we are near the end of our webinar. However, uh, we do want to open this up uh, if there's any remaining questions. Um, you know, we're trying to address those uh, as we could, but we had we received a lot, uh, so it's hard if we can address every single one. But um, if there's anything that has not been addressed or um, you have questions uh, for uh, any of our presenters, um, please use the Q&A box, and we'll, we'll try to address a few before we have to close out. So I have one question here is, um, have you considered doing a consequential uh, validity study? We have not yet. Actually, next on the docket is we want to do some pre predictive validity and um, probably with the next survey instruments, um, but we have not put that on our list of things to do yet. But um, if that's if you use the stat and you want to partner with us, um, shoot us an email and we would definitely be interested. And I think that uh, addresses another question. Uh, uh, we have one person that was asking if this instrument is available for other institutions to use. Yes, uh, the, it is available on the ndacte.org website, and we just ask that you give copyright uh, back to NDACTE, and that is indicated on the instrument itself. So it is available and ready for use. Um, again, we just appreciate hearing if you are using it so that we can uh, begin to kind of keep track of where it is being implemented. And I think uh, you might have already addressed this, but another question we have is, um, you mentioned uh, student teachers use the STOT to self-evaluate uh, as a learning tool. Um, have you, or you considered looking at uh, validity studies for those self-evaluations? We have not yet. Um, we started out with just the cooperating teachers and university supervisors, but again, that's certainly something that um, we could put on our to-do list and if, uh, Joshua wants to partner. We are very interested in doing this kind of work. Great. And at the institutional level, you know, a lot of what we're working with with the STOT is the formative process. And so the self-evaluation component for a student, we do use that data to take a look at how it relates to the university supervisor as well as the cooperating teacher's rating. But the final ratings um, in terms of uh, continuance in the program and what we're really looking for in terms of providing data on our completion uh, completion for our candidates is really on the supervisor, the cooperating teacher, not the student, which is why we uh, brought that up as a, a reflective opportunity for them and again for them to make comparison and then set some growth goals as well. Um, okay, maybe one more here. Um, can the STOT be used for the first and third years of full-time teaching as a self-evaluation and supervisor evaluation by the building principal uh, for measuring student impact? Um, so that's, there are a couple questions in there. Um, yeah. Uh, um, so it's built on the in-test standards, which are professional teaching standards, you know, not just for pre-service, but for in-service as well. So the intention is there for the instrument to be used you know, for, for teachers. Um, we have not validated it on in-service teachers, but I know that there are, in, there are institutions in North Dakota that are using it um, for their CAPE standard four um, with their in-service teachers, and we're just, we need to get a, enough numbers. You know, you need, you really want 100 or more um, if you want to do a good uh, factor, internal factor analysis, and so we're just waiting for some of those numbers. Um, and then the second question is about measuring student impact. It really isn't that sort of an instrument. It's an observation tool, and it doesn't um, it doesn't measure student learning Great. directly. 
All right. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I think with that, we will uh, we'll come to an end. Um, so first, I want to give a big thank you to to Gary, to Stacy, Sarah, and Alan. Um, thank you so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you all um, to prepare for this uh, presentation. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all so much for joining us, and uh, we really appreciate your time.